So uh, we're going to talk about dynamics processing today. Um, uh, and the concept behind dynamics processing, mostly when we refer to dynamic, dynamics processing, we talk about compressors. Okay. Um, however, it can also refer to other things. Could, dynamics processing could refer to a gate, a limiter, an expander. I'll explain some of those other things a little bit later, but for now, let's talk about compression. So, uh, compression is this thing that, some, for some reason, people have seem to have a tough time wrapping their head around what it does and how it really works. Um, I'm going to simplify it for you. A compressor is simply an automatic volume knob. Okay, that's all it is. So, imagine you sitting there mixing a show, you've got your fingers on faders, right? And at some points you decide to move the fader up, right? And then at other points you decide to move the fader down. Well, why would you decide to move the fader up? Because what you're hearing is for some reason too quiet to you. And, what, and then why would you want to turn the fader down? Because now it got too loud, right? So this is what you do, right? You're listening to it as it gets quiet, you turn it up, as it gets loud, you turn it down. That's all a compressor does is just automates that process for you. Okay, it will automatically turn stuff down when it gets too loud and turn it back up when it gets quiet again. That's it. That's all a compressor does. It's it just rides the fader for you. So uh, the way I like to think about it is just pretend there's a little Smurf inside the box, okay? And he's got his little headphones on and he's listening to the sound coming in and he's got his hand on a little slider and he's just riding the fader for you. So here's my little I can't do a smurf because I was a little worried. Um, we made this back when Jordan Kerner was still dean of the film school, and he sort of owns the Smurfs right now. So I was a little worried about doing smurf. So I, 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 it's, it's a blue gnome. It's not a smurf. Okay. So here's my little blue gnome with his white lab coat on. And, uh, you know, what he's doing is uh, the sound is coming in here on the left, right? So we, we can pull up the sound, and he's, he's looking at the meter is what he's doing because um, it was easier to do that was that was a clearer animation than to have him listen to some arbitrary thing on headphones um, but he could do that too so he's sitting here he's looking at the meter and he's got his hand on a volume lever okay and we need to somehow tell him what to do so um, what's what sort of information are we going to need to tell him in order for him to know how to ride the fader for us the way we want Yeah. So, um, how what essentially what we, what we need to tell him is how loud is too loud, right? If anything gets louder than this, we want you to do something about it. Okay. So that is called a threshold. So let me just turn on some audio here. Okay. So here he is. He's looking at the music. He's doing nothing right now because we haven't told him to do anything yet. Uh, but here's a threshold. So if we say, uh, if we lower this threshold, we say we could take it down to like minus 15 dB or 16 dB. We're, we're going to say, okay, if anything gets louder than minus 16 dB, then you should really do something about that. Okay. Great, so we've told him that. Why is he not moving the lever yet? Right, we haven't told him what exactly to do when something gets louder than minus 16. We've told him, hey, when minus 16 dB comes, you really ought to do something. But we haven't told him what the something is. So what do we need to tell him to do about it? Right, turn it down, right? Pull the lever down. Is that all we need to tell him? Like, just pull the lever down? When it gets... By how much, right? So by how much do we want him to turn it down? There is no, it's, it would be difficult to say, like, well, by 6 dB, right? Because it sort of depends on how much louder it is past the threshold, right? The louder it gets past the threshold, the more we're going to want him to turn it down. So we do it in terms of a ratio. <clears throat> so this ratio here is, you know, we can say, like, 2 to 1. And here he goes. So what we mean when we say 2 to 1 is... The extent to which it goes above the threshold, you would reduce it by half as much. So if it goes 6 dB over the threshold, 
turn it down by 3 dB. If it goes 10 dB above the threshold, turn it down 5 dB, right? Two to one ratio. So essentially the sounds are still going to be above the threshold. He is just going to reduce the extent to which they have gone past the threshold. Sorry, uh, so explain the difference between two to one and three to one again. So two to one ratio would be however much the sound goes above the, the, the threshold, attenuate it down half that much. So if it's 6 dB above the threshold, turn it down by 3 dB. If it's 10 dB past the threshold, turn it down 5 dB. If it's 20 dB past the threshold, turn it down 10 dB, right? That's a 2 to 1 ratio. If we did a 4 to 1 ratio, then we're saying do it by a factor of, you know, a 4 to 1 reduction. So if it goes up 8 dB above the threshold, he's going to turn it down 6 dB. Okay? So, and you can take it all the way up to, you know, really high, uh, this is a 30 to 1, and most, most compressors will let you go up to what they call infinity to 1, and infinity to 1 is a limiter. So a limiter is a compressor that has a ratio of infinity to 1, and what that basically means is nothing is ever allowed to be louder than the threshold. Right? He will attenuate it infinitely when it passes the threshold. Right? So, uh, so here we go, here he is. I'll set our back, our, our ratio back to two. This is a little aggressive, I think. He's, you know, he's riding it a little too aggressive. So I think my threshold's a little low. I'm going to take it up to maybe ten, minus ten. Why are the meters reading exactly the same? Well. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> Some of it is because he's, you know, he's really not compressing real aggressively. But what you should really look at is, you know, if you when you get to these big peaks, this will get up in the orange, and it this won't as much. Oh, I see. Yeah, I can see. It is low. You know, here, there it was going into two oranges, and here it's only going into one. So if we, if we do it really aggressively, we can we could see a, a bigger difference. So if we we can take our threshold down quite a bit and our ratio up quite a bit, right? And now he's doing quite a bit now. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some of these other things we can tell him. So there's these other values called attack and release. So attack is the amount of time it takes him to complete the attenuation. Okay, so from the moment when he realizes that something is louder than the threshold and begins turning it down, he knows he's going to do, if, it's, if he sees something at 6 dB above the threshold, so he says, okay, i got to turn that down by 3 dB. How long does it take him? to complete that 3 dB fade. This is not how quickly he reacts. He reacts instantly, but it's like how slow is that fade? That's the attack. So do we want him to drop it immediately? If so, we would do an attack of zero. Okay, and you can, if you look at the graph here, the attenuator graph, you know, we're, we're basically dropping instantly. There's no ramp to him dropping me. He's like <coughs> cutting it really quick. But if we increase the attack, you know, stay to like 40 milliseconds, he's softer about it now, right? He's, he's, react, he's moving the fader more slowly. Release is the opposite of that. Release is how long does it take him to fade it back up once it once the input goes back below the threshold. And right now it's set to 100 milliseconds. And you can kind of see him slowly fading it back up. I can take it up, up to like 200 milliseconds. See him slowly fading it up now when it goes back. So if I get a really high attack and a really high release, he's going to be 
very lazy. Right? Very, much smoother in, in how he's doing, doing these attenuations. And that's compression. Okay, automatic volume knob. Threshold, ratio, attack, release. There's a, depending on you know what sort of compressor you have, you may have some other features. For example, we built into this one what's called a look ahead. And this really was only possible once, once we started doing compression digitally um, because there's a buffer, right? As we know, there's a digital buffer in every piece of equipment. A digital equipment anyway. And because there's a buffer, we could tell the Smurf instead of looking at or listening to the level right now that's coming off the buffer, look and see what's coming into the buffer and, re and respond, you know, preemptively to that. Okay, so we can, we can have him kind of look into the future and it, may, it makes his response much more quicker. This is really useful if you're trying to do a limiter and you absolutely cannot tolerate any sound going past the threshold. If you can increase the look ahead, give him a few milliseconds to look ahead, then he'll see that peak coming before it ever hits, and he'll be ready for it. What do you gain? What do you lose with that, though? Um, well, it, you know... Like, is that a lot more possible? Not really. What it, what it does is it, you know, it sounds less natural, you know, because... Um, if you if you think about trying to mimic you know your ability to mix a show, that's what you're trying to do is, is mimic the you know the effect of somebody riding a fader. You know you you don't react that quickly. You know you, you hear it first and then you do it. So um, so a look ahead tends to sound not particularly natural. Uh, you know a natural a compression without a look ahead, you're going to have these these peaks that that go past the threshold temporarily and then are attenuated, right? So there's a natural ebb and flow to it. Um, the reason this is called a compressor is it is compressing the dynamic range. So the net result here is that there is a smaller difference between qu loud things and quiet things. Okay? Uh, so if you've got, you know, 40 dB difference between the loudest part of the, of the sound and the quietest stuff, that may not be okay. Like you, you, you may have a noise floor in your room where those quiet things would not be heard because of that. So a compressor could turn down some of that loud stuff, and now your loudest things are only 20 dB louder than the quietest thing. And so now you only have a 20 dB range, and that's where this notion of makeup gain comes in. Is once you've compressed it, ultimately the whole thing starts sounding quieter. Okay. So if I just bypass it, you know, here's no compression. If I turn on the compressor, you know, the whole thing sounds quieter now. And it's, but it's also greatly compressed dynamic range. I can get that level back by turning up my makeup gain, which essentially turns the whole thing up then after it's been compressed. So now you're taking that short, that smaller dynamic range and turning it all up. This has the effect of essentially turning up the quiet things instead of turning down the loud things. All right, so there he is. He's doing his little thing. Um, so the knee is, there's, there's the attack, which is the length of the fade, okay, and the knee is how, how quickly, in the, in the first moments of that fade, is that a linear drop, or is that smoother? So when he first starts to react, does he instantly start pulling it down at a linear level, or does he kind of ease it in a little bit first and then fade it down? So, so the, the knee is, is easing it in a little bit and then pulling it. The, um, the uh, units of knee that I've seen are like one through 
five. Mm -hmm. So what is one and what is like which one is which? So five would be a really rounded attenuation curve, right? So it'd be, it's the the way that this looks. Um, let's see if I can show you. Um, this would make more sense in logic because this does. I don't have a knee on this. Um, uh, let's see here. This compressor doesn't have it. Let me pull up the C4 compressor or C1 compressor. Okay, so the concept of a knee is if I set this up and I drop my threshold, turn up my ratio, Okay, so what's happening here is what is what they're saying is level coming in at minus twenty will go out as minus forty as a result of the compression. That's what this graph is. As long as it's linear, it's the same. So here, minus sixty goes out at minus sixty. Minus forty goes out at you know minus forty three. Minus twenty goes out as minus forty. So on and so forth. Okay. So the knee is that part. So that can be uh, really <coughs> sharp, or it can be uh, very smooth. This is a very, very smooth knee. Um, and I don't know if I can adjust that on, on this. Let me see. That's our threshold. Yeah, see, this one doesn't have a knee. I think the one. So let's find one that does. Yeah, you know, this doesn't show me a graph, though. Let's see if we can find it. Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't have any on here that, that really will show you the knee, but um, I'll just have to graph it and draw it out for you. So basically, if you, if you imagine that, that graph, that input-output graph, it ends up looking something like this. So you're linear for a little while, then the compressor kicks in, and you start attenuating. Okay? So this would be a very sharp knee. Uh, a softer knee would do... When would you ever use a sharp knee? So, uh, uh, you know, if you're trying to do like a limiter that's that's doing really hard limiting protection for some, for last week or something, you certainly would probably want a hard knee. You want it to get it right away. Um, so, but that that's what the knee is. If it, you know, most most compressors these days already have some sort of softening knee to them. Um, everyone, but every once in a while you'll run into one that'll let you manipulate that. I mean that's what they're doing. It's you know the what when I have the situations where I found I've wanted to manipulate the knee have been when I feel like I've got the threshold and the ratio pretty good and the attack feels right to me, but I'm just the that that initial kick of of, it, of the compressor kicking in it feels too abrupt to me, and I'll increase the knee and it just it doesn't change. The rate, the, the rate at which it gets reduced, it doesn't change the attack or any of that, but it just it softens that initial kick in of the compressor. Um, so, anyway, higher value would be softer, yeah. basically. Um, so, I want to try a couple other signals here. Which one are we on right now? This, oh, here. So this here's something a little more percussive, the, the plucked guitar. So you can kind of see how quickly he responds. Now right now I've got really long attack. So he's he's kind of 
easing this in and out. But if I take the attack out, you can hear it punching in as he as he ducks it. Right? Whereas if I increase the attack, it's not quite as bad. And ultimately my, my threshold's too low here. Um, here's just a somebody singing, and what's interesting about this, I'm going to let you listen to it for a second, just without any processing. You said you loved me. This is one of our test recordings we've done, so there's no reverb on this. There's you know no no processing, no anything. It's just raw singer singing, which is everybody sounds like this without us helping them. So. So the first thing you notice is it's kind of quiet. The sun comes up. I think about you. The, the part of the reason why it's so quiet is that she gets quite loud a little bit later here. I want you so. It's like I'm losing my mind. The morning ends. So you're just starting to get a little bit louder. The thought of you stays bright. Sometimes I stand. And here she's going to start getting much louder. Not going left, not going right. I dim the lights okay. and things. So ultimately, I would like to compress this a little bit. Spend sleepless nights. Yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So, uh, what I want to do is I want to set my threshold so that it's he's not doing anything when she's quiet. Okay. So here she's quiet and he's doing something. So I don't want that. So maybe minus twenty nine or thirty. No, maybe 25. There you go. So now he's kind of leaving her alone when she's quiet like this. And there, now she starts getting a little bit louder. He's going to start turning it down a little bit. All afternoon, doing every little chore. The thought of you stays bright. Sometimes I stand in the middle of the floor, not going left, not going right. Right. And so then, yeah, now we can turn the whole thing up a little bit. You said you loved me. And it'll, it, it's going to be much more even now, even when she gets quiet. Okay. 
So I have threshold is like minus 22. I've got a 2 to 1 ratio. Attack is around 70 milliseconds. Release is around 200 milliseconds. I mean, there's no formula for this. It, it just depends on... It's entirely dependent on, on the audio signal. This is right for her voice in this recording. It's not going to be right for anything else. Yeah. This is Martha. You remember Martha? Who did the wigs or South Pacific? It's like I'm losing Martha, Martha? my mind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was Martha. She used to be an opera singer. Oh. All afternoon. I have more of a. Yeah. She used to be an opera singer before she was a. She went to CCM for for opera. Sometimes I stand in the middle of the floor. Not going left. Okay, so nowhere near as dynamic. Not going right. I dim the lights and think about you. Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, uh, is that destroying the sound? No, that's that's her. <laughs> you said you loved me, or were you? Just be Sounds a little closer like when she sings the loudest notes. Hmm. Or am I losing I mean, there might be some imperfections in my compressor that we've made here, but this is not meant to be a fantastic sounding compressor. <laughs> it's meant to be a good demo. Compressor and dynamics and logic, is that pretty good? I don't know. I don't ever really use it. I use the Waves ones, um, but I think it's pretty okay. Um, I want you so. It's like yeah. I'm losing my mind. So let's talk about some of the uh, iterations on this theme. So we've talked about a limiter. A limiter is a compressor that just has a ratio of infinity to one. Um, that's really all there is to it. And some limiters uh, will also have a built-in makeup gain. So they will. The, this notion of, of turning the whole thing up, the makeup gain after it's been compressed, they will do that automatically. So what, whatever amount they have turned it down by, they will then increase the entire audio signal by that much automatically. So that you, you're that that would be the kind of limiter you wouldn't want to use to protect a system, right? If you're going to use a limiter to keep a loudspeaker from being blown, you wouldn't want it to be doing any makeup gain because the whole point is you don't ever want the voltage to go past this certain amount. But if you're trying to do to limit something because you're trying to get it to sit in a mix a little bit better, um, it's, it saves you one extra step uh, not having to do that makeup gain. It'll do that automatically for you. And that's what the, some of the limiters I'll show you in a minute will do that. An expander uh, is just the opposite so of a compressor. All the same variables, right? You still have a threshold, you still have a ratio, attack and release, but what's happening here is instead of turning it down when it goes past the threshold, he turns it up. So if you say it's a two to one ratio on an expander and the sound goes past the threshold by three dB, he's going to turn it up to six dB above the threshold, right? If it goes up five dB past the threshold, he's going to turn it up to 10 dB. So he's increasing the dynamic range. He's making the loud things louder. Okay, that's an expander. When one practical thing, what do you use one of those? Okay, well, uh, wireless microphones do this called companding. So uh, in order to narrow the, the, the width of the frequency band that that wireless microphone has to utilize, the transmitter compresses the signal pretty aggressively uh, so that it, so it's, it's so dynamically it's not as, as large and therefore doesn't require as, as big of a swath of frequencies because we need frequencies, right? They're, they're, they're harder to come by these days. So uh, the mic will, com will compress it. And then the receiver applies the inverse of the compression using an expander. So the expander then takes whatever the compressor did and undoes it. And it's called companding. Um, and you know, really good wireless microphones have really good companding. <laughs> um, the, the, you know, it's uh, like the, the UHFRs that we have, they have what they call reference grade companding, which is if you take an impulse response, measure it going into that mic, and then measure it coming out of the receiver. 
the impulse responses are identical. Wow. Um, the companding is that precise. Um, we spent a lot of money on those <laughs> to get that reference grade companding. Um, uh, cheaper wireless microphones are not going to have that good a companding, and, you, and you'll you'll hear. You know, there will be slight differences as from what's coming out of the receiver from what came in, uh, dynamic-wise. Um, so that's just one example of, of using an expander would be to overcome compression that's happened. Um, there are you can do backwards compression and backwards expansion as well. <laughs> so backwards compression would be he turns things up when they drop below the threshold. So the fun one way to think about the function of compression is compression takes the, si the signals and tries to get them closer to the threshold. So it just right? Do the opposite. Wow. Right? Well, sort of. So, so backwards compression, instead of taking the loud things and turning them down, he's taking the quiet things and turning them up. Okay? Backwards expansion is instead of taking the loud things and making them louder, he's taking the quiet things and making them quieter. Okay. Uh, we have some very swanky uh, compressors or dynamic, they call them dynamic equalizers in the shop called D the DPR 9012s, the BSS ones that you guys are always trying to get me to surplus. And I say, no, they're the coolest things ever. We will not surplus those. Yeah, and, it, and the reason why is because those things do all four types of dynamic processing. They will do forwards and backwards compression and forwards and backwards expansion. The DPR 901s from BSS. And they will do it on a frequency conscious basis. So in this compressor, he's just listening to everything and he's doing it. But those, those, uh, processors, you can zero in on a certain frequency band. So you can say this octave range of frequencies, process only that octave and leave the other ones alone. So within a certain octave band of frequencies, you can say compress it regularly or compress it backwards or expand it. Or you know, I, I use those all the time. One of the great things I love about the Allen Heath iLife console is um, it's the same company that owns Allen and Heath owns BSS now, <laughs> Harman. And so they have created a plug-in for the iLive that mimics the DPR-901. And I use it all the time. Yeah. It's way cool. And so what I use it for is if I've got a singer who changes the, their point of resonance depending on how loud they sing. Some singers do this. It's like they get louder and the sound resonates in their head in a totally different place than it does when they're singing quietly. And you're trying to EQ that, that's really hard because essentially the whole frequency response of their voice changes when they get louder or quieter. Um, and no EQ is gonna, there's no one EQ setting that can fix that. But if you can get one of these things that's a compressor that is, or is sometimes called a dynamic equalizer, but it's a compressor, a multi-band compressor, you can do that. So what I can do is I can say, hey, look, when this person gets loud, um, some, for some reason, the 4K range just gets out of control because it's resonating in a certain way. So I can say, keep, a look, keep an eye on this 4K range. And if it starts getting too loud, just, just compress that a little bit. Leave everything else. And, but if it's not, when, when she's singing quietly, leave it alone. Okay, um, or I can say you know when if you do the opposite, I, I have some sometimes like you'll have actors that get that lose all of their diction when they get quiet. Okay, so that when they start singing or talking quietly, they lose all of their plosives and things just get lost. So I can say okay, everything above two K, which is where all the articulation is, whenever that stuff drops below this this threshold, turn it up. And when they get loud and they start getting, all their diction goes up and it leaves it alone, lets it through just fine. Um, so that in that case, I'm using backwards compression on a frequency conscious basis, okay? 
Um, there are some plugins that will do this in Logic. I'll show you in a second. Okay, but uh, so that those are those are the different sorts of, of dynamics processing. You've got forwards compression, forwards expansion, backwards compression, backwards expansion, and you have limiting. And limiting is forwards compression with an infinite to one ratio. The other sort of processor that falls in this family is called a gate. Okay, and the, the notion of a gate essentially eliminates the idea of a ratio. Okay, so there's no sense of variable attenuation. It essentially, it essentially, instead of having the Smurf manipulate a volume knob, the Smurf's manipulating a mute button. Okay, and you're just saying, if the sound ever gets past this threshold, unmute it. And, if it, and for anything that's below the threshold, mute the channel, we don't want to hear it. Uh, this is, I use this sometime with God mics for directors that forget to flip switches, you know, for mics, for God mics. I'll put a gate on it and I'll just say, you know, when they're not using it, they stick it down on the floor under the seat and the switch and they've left it on and we don't need to hear them whispering and doing all this. So, you know, at that point it's very quiet. I could put a gate on it and say, if it's ever, I have to just, I look at the level you know, what, where it is when they have it sitting on the seat. I'll just set a threshold that's a little bit above that. And I'll say, anything that gets louder than that, go ahead and unmute it. That must mean that they're actually talking into the mic. <laughs> and if they put it down and stuck it under the seat and, it, and it's below that threshold, just mute it. And then I don't need to chase it. The Smurf will chase it for me. I did that for the orchestra mics for the, um, for Opera. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's not going to be loud enough like you could hear pages turning in the uh -huh. orchestra when I was in high school, so I whisper a lot. Yeah. Um, but the opera singers didn't need to be loud enough. Right. So you put a gate on it? Yeah. But there were a couple of days where like I started cutting out the triangle and they were like, why can't I hear the triangle? Right. I'm trying to help you. Yeah. So that you gotta be careful with the gate because sometimes it'll mute it when you don't want to if you don't get the settings just right. Um, but that's that's what it'll that's what the gate will do. It's just on and off. You can't Well you can there is, you, some gates will give you an attack and a release, which is the equivalent of, of a fade in and a fade out. Then, so instead of popping it in, it'll kind of ease it in. I used that one time on um, an English horn player that I recorded one time, and his his playing style was just very abrupt. You know, the, the transitions between notes were very sharp and just weird, and and I put a gate on it with really slow attacks and releases. And so all of his notes just eased in and eased out very fluidly. Um, and it worked really well. <laughs> um, so that's, that's a gate. It's an automatic mute button. Now, just to further blow your mind, and I don't, I, I'll see if I can demonstrate this in logic, you can have a dynamics processor, a compressor, or a gate, or a limiter, or whatever, that processes one sound while listening to a different one. Okay, so right here I've got incoming audio and outcoming audio. And the Smurf is listening to whatever the music is we're listening to, right? And he's compressing that. But I could have him listen to something else. I could have him listen to the jazz loop, but actually compress the Martha's singing. Right, so he's responding to the dynamics of the jazz loop, but compressing her according to what the jazz loop is doing. Okay, it's called a side chain. Okay, so you, you give the processor a side chain, and you're basically saying, listen to this thing to know what to do, but process something else in response. Okay. Why would you ever want to do that? Well, uh, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, this is the, the classic example of this would be uh, if you've got like a rock band, right? And you've got your, your bass player bumping away in the bass and your, and your drummer hitting the kick drum. Well, usually they're supposed to be doing kind of the same thing, the kick drum and the bass, okay? But maybe they're not, maybe you've got a lazy bass player, okay? And he's lagging behind. You could put a gate on his bass with a side chain to the kick drum. Okay, so the bass gets unmuted when the kick drum hits. So that you're fixing the bass player's inability to match. Yeah. <laughs> that is awesome. 
You don't have any bad drummer bro. <laughs> I go, yeah. So you can tighten the whole thing up just by you know in introducing a side chain. So you put the gate on the bass, but the side chain is the drum. So you say you set a threshold that says when the drum gets beyond the threshold, and you know, you can set that when it gets loud, open up the bass. And when the when the when the bass drum is not hitting, mute the bass. Right? Right? That, that that's a classic example of using a side chain. Yeah, yeah. So Another uh, another kind of fun example that some students did one time for a portfolio review right, is they uh, they created it was a fun little demo so they had a little mic sitting out there um, and they had a, a processor in there that and they had a side chain on and the gate was gating the sound of a an applause loop just like people it was a whole stadium of people applauding okay um, and they had the mic hooked up to the side chain for that gate. So what would happen is, uh, you would say, whenever that mic has you know, loud enough sound on it, open up the gate for the applause. Okay, so anytime anybody walked up and talked into the mic and say, hello, check one, two, applause would erupt. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris Payne did that for a portfolio. Um, that's awesome. So those are just, that's just some examples of sidechain. Um, you, but you can do sidechains on compressors, too. And there's the scenarios where you could envision saying, Compress this based on this other thing. So, um, if you know, the, the idea there would be uh, if you want if you want the singer to sound more dynamic than they really are, instead of expanding, running an expander on them, you could put a compressor on the backing music using their voice as the side chain. Which means when they get louder, the music gets quieter, right? And suddenly they sound as though they got way louder than their, their voice. Wow, what did they just do with their voice? They just got so loud. It's amazing. But what really just happened is the music got quieter. Okay. <laughs> okay. So to backtrack, what is the difference between a forward compressor and a backward expander? So a forward compressor will take things that got louder than the threshold and turned them down. A backward expander takes things that dropped below the threshold and turns them down. Yep. Well, so forward compression takes loud things and makes them quieter. Backward expansion takes quiet things and makes them quieter. Backward expansion is quieter. Yep. So the other way to think about it, expansion always gets the sound further away from the threshold. Right? The loud things get turned up, the quiet things get turned down. So taking them farther away from the threshold. Compression takes things closer to the threshold, either by turning the loud things down or the quiet things up. I really, you know, I really like backwards compression. Which is one of the reasons why I love the DPR 901s because sometimes my problem is not that they're getting too loud. If, if I'm doing a musical, for example, I like that they're loud. I mean, the whole point is I'm trying to get them to be loud enough to be heard. I don't, you know, I don't necessarily want to be turning it down when they get loud. It's when they get quiet that I have a problem. And so backwards compression can be great because I can just say, "Hey, look, when they get quieter, turn them up." And if they're singing loud, leave them alone. They're doing what I need them to do. Backwards compression is turning quiet things up. Important. Forward compression is loud things get turned down. Got it, got it, got it. And backwards is sideways short things up. Yep, exactly. So I do that all the time I, on, you know, on live, see, yeah. live mics, you know, in musicals. It's like, look, when they're loud, leave them alone. They're, 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 they're doing what I need. I don't want to kill that. Uh, but when they get quiet, turn them up. <laughs> That's useful. Can you show us how to set up the side chain? Yeah, let's see if we can figure something out here. So, um, mm -hmm. so ducking is <laughs> so ducking is uh, is 
sort of like the opposite of what Chris Bain did. So ducking is taking, uh, it's, it's a side chain, it's a compressor that is using a side chain. It's, it's, what it's, what's happening is the classic use of the ducker is you've got like, you know, background music in a lobby or something. And then you've got somebody needs to make an announcement. And so they're going to pull up a PA mic and make an announcement. And what you want is when they start talking to that mic, you want the background music to get quieter. So a duck, that's what a ducker would do. So you would have the compressor connected up to the music and say, hey, look, turn this stuff down, but listen to the mic to do it. So if the mic exceeds this threshold, turn the music down. That's a ducker. That would be so useful when it's like counting down. It's like, I don't know when that announcement is going to come in. It's yeah. Like, so a, a ducker is just a compressor with a side chain. Okay. So let's see if we can figure out. Let me let's figure out a side chain here. I can't do it with this one. Um, I can't do it with this one. May need to do, let's see, this one maybe. Yeah, here we go. Okay, so here is the compressor in Logic. Okay. Uh, I don't know. This is the new Logic 10 interface for it. They're trying to like make it look like old gear or something. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it over to sidechain mode. And the side chain's up here, and I can say, you know, which track do I want it to listen to. So this is um, this is a Phantom of the Opera recording I did back when I did that show. Um, and so I've got the Phantom track, and you know, I'm gonna compress it based on Christine's voice. Okay, so we're gonna listen to Christine, but we're gonna compress Phantom. I don't know why we'd want to do this, but why not? Okay, so um, <clears throat> so that's all fine. We're going to set our threshold to sure minus twenty, ratio two to one. Here's a knee, attack, release, so on and so forth. So let me see if I can get to a part where they're both singing. So well, here's Christine going. Phantom's getting compressed, right? He's not singing, so it doesn't really matter. But but we're looking at the the Phantom compressor, right? This is the compressor on the Phantom's voice. But she's singing, and so he's getting compressed accordingly. So that that's the music behind what she's saying. No, the Phantom is the voice. He's it's another voice. Oh. He's not singing right. I'm going to find a part where he sings. So, he, so here he is, um, and now I'm using her input to compress him. So here he's singing, he's not getting compressed, right? So he only gets compressed when she starts singing. So let's find a part when they both, here we go. Here's the part where they both start singing. So maybe I really like Christine or something, and you know we've been dating, and I really want to hear. I really don't like this Phantom guy. He's always like getting in the way of me hearing the, so Christine, and so I'm gonna compress Phantom with Christine's side chain. So every time they're singing together, she's always louder. <laughs> that is killer. Right? That could save a lot of relationships. Yeah, <laughs> and then I don't have to worry about it. It's just like I said it, and every time they're singing together, Christine's always the louder one. Yes, Christine's and, paying for it. That she's going to want to hear all that. Of course, yeah. So you know, <laughs> that's killer. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of fun things you can do. Um, so I want. I'll, let me show you some of the. I'm doing lots of different compression on this. The reason I pulled this up is I'm doing compression at lots of different stages in lots of different ways. So I just wanted to kind of show you what what I'm doing here. Um, if we look at the beginning of this. So this is Christine. She's singing very quietly right now. I mean, if you just look at the waveform, she's doing very quiet. But she gets louder later. So I've got a threshold set at minus 15, which she's barely hitting right now. But now she went past it, and it's compressing her now. Yep. And I got a 9 dB makeup gain. So I'm turning the whole thing up 9 dB after it's compressed. That's why she's able to sit so well above the thing. Without it, this is what it sounds like. So if I just bypass the compressor, this is what we get. Okay, so she's doing a great performance. She's singing quite nicely, but it's too dynamic for the music that's behind her. <laughs> okay, so I had to compress it in order to, for us to even hear her, right? So if I compress it, then now we can hear all that quiet stuff. Yeah, two to one ratio. I've got threshold at five, 15 dB, but then I'm a nine dB makeup gain. Okay, so what I'm, I'm doing nothing to the quiet stuff. I'm just turning down the loud stuff and then taking the whole thing and turning it up. And now even the, the quiet stuff and the loud stuff sounds similar. Okay, I'm doing the same thing with him. So he comes in. Oop, that's still her. Hang on. Here's his. So he's doing this amazing. He's like really loud and then very quiet, really loud and then very quiet. So without the compressor, this is what we would have. Right, so every time he like drops down to those like really quiet, quiet notes, it's like we lose it. It's like where'd that go? So, yeah, I mean, you could mix it, right? You could ride that fader, and yeah, I mean, some would argue that's the job of the mixer. If this was live, yeah. And in fact, you you talk to like the really veteran, you know, Broadway mix engineers, you say, "Where's your compressors?" And they hold up their ten fingers, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And they, they take great pride in that, and that's fine. I mean, you know, if, if, you're, if you're that good and you can keep track of 10 different signals all at once and compress them all live, more power to you. Um, the, the mere mortals in the world, you know, like me, I'll turn on my compressor, you know. <laughs> so if I turn the compressor back on, this is what we get with him. Sing once again with me, how strange right. All those notes he's swallowing, suddenly we have them. Makes loud and soft sound different. His softness now is a change of timbre. Yeah. It's yeah. not volume. Amplitude. Right, and this is this is you know this is the double-edged sword here. Okay, so like any good thing, if used for evil, you know it can <laughs> cause trouble. So you can over-compress things like crazy, and then um, and then you've got things sound weird. You know, like a lot of people, for example, really give uh, Idina Menzel a really hard time if you listen to like her recordings, because it's like she just sounds like she's shouting all the time. 
Holy angry. Right? But it's because of how much they're compressing her. Okay, she has a very dynamic voice. Like, she, I mean, she can belt like crazy. And that sounds really amazing on a Broadway stage. But you try to capture that in a recording, that kind of dynamic range in a recording, and get it to where somebody could listen to it in their car. And it just doesn't translate. And so what they do is they compress really aggressively her vocal, like on, you know, like Let It Go for, you know, uh, Frozen. It's like so compressed. And it's like, and then it just ends up sounding shrill, right? So when she gets loud, it's just like sounding shrill. She's not actually getting louder. She's just like getting really, there's, it just sounds weird. Um, and it's because of the compression. The compression is robbing this like really fundamental part of what she's trying to do. And, you know, she has no control over that. But that, that happened way downstream after she recorded, you know, a year after she recorded that, you know, somebody went in and squashed it. Um, so, you know, you got to be careful. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to take this. I just had a lot of uh, problems in the 70s. Maybe I was using cheap compressors and stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, it, just, it sounded phony. It didn't sound real. And then the classical people who had their heads up there, you know what, yeah. never used compression because they thought it was cha you know, coloring things, but the speaker can't reproduce what you need to use on. Right. And that's the, that's the, the trick is, yeah, of course, you know, it's what sounds, it sounds amazing live, but trying to capture that in a recording yeah. and then listening to it in a normal listening environment that's not a concert hall, that's been acoustically tuned and everything, it doesn't translate. So a certain amount of compression has to be done. Um, I think there's, a, there's sort of a loudness war that's been going on in, in the recording industry where, you know, everyone wants the loudest record, you know. And it's accomplished with compression, so it just means that now stuff has like no dynamic range at all. Uh, and you listen to you know, this compression kind yeah, of yeah. I mean, it's right. It's like you know, it's heavily compressed. Um, in this case, I had to compress this pretty, pretty aggressively because we might. We the reason we did this is we thought we may need to flip over to this click track live. Because there's some notes that Christine has to sing in this song that are tough on her voice. And we didn't have, I mean, we did have an understudy, but she had nowhere near the voice that this, this girl had. And we were worried. Um, and in, in reality, in the, in, you know, the Hal Prince production, they, sang, they don't sing it live. They sing it once in a recording session and never sang it again. It was all done by click track. Um, they lip synced this song. Um, so... You know, and this girl really wanted to sing it live. I mean, she says, no, I think I'm, I'm, I really want to do it live. And I said, okay, well, I, let's record it anyway. Because if you blow out your voice halfway through the run, um, we're screwed. So, <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and record it, and we'll see how it goes. And, you know, we don't have to use it, but I had to get it ready. So it was running. So Because half of the music on here is not played live. I mean, this song, half of the music in this song is, is not in the orchestration. It's a recording. You have to use it. So the conductor had to put on headphones for this song and listen to a click track and conduct against it. So I was already going to have to play that music. And so I had her voices and his voices loaded up already. They just were muted. And if we ever needed to, we could just bring it up. So I had to get it to where it would fit in the mix, in that live mix. And things were getting, this was a loud song. Okay. Um, and I, I couldn't allow that kind of dynamics. Otherwise, it would just get lost in, in the loudness of the number. So I had to compress it pretty pretty aggressively um, for that reason. Um, normally I wouldn't like quite that aggressive of compression, but it, it needed to be done for this one. Um, let me show you some other places where I'm compressing here. So here, on this track. Okay, so this bus four is my vocal bus, okay? And I have a limiter here, really just to overcome my own laziness. <laughs> because when I start summing their voices together and I've done such aggressive compression, I, they could sum together and clip. And so I just have a limiter with a threshold set to zero dB full scale. And what will happen is if they ever get to where they would clip, from summation, this will stop it before that happens. There, see? So it's just, 
it's stopping it from clipping before it happens. I don't like the way that sounds, but it was, you know, I, I didn't have the time to go back and figure out why it was clipping, so I just said I'm just going to put that limiter on there and then I'll suck it up. That's you know. why you don't record it when you're playing. Well, and the reverb too. So if I take the reverb off, it you don't have that problem. So let me show you that. So if I if I kill the reverb, then it so the reverb sums on top of it too, and that can create it. So if, if we go back to where it was clipping. Your spirit and my voice in one okay. So they're not they're not exceeding the threshold quite as, not as aggressively as they were. So the reverb is sum is is summing together with it as well, and that's it's potentially overloading it. So I'm just using this limiter, this L1 limiter, to stop that. I mean, I'm not even lowering the threshold. I'm just saying if it ever hits zero dB full scale, kill it. The good news is, and this is just a little dirty little secret that that you know that logic is not very upfront about. But um, because the, this is now 64-bit processors and logic is now 64-bit thing. All your samples are processed internally at 64 bits, regardless of what, what bit rate they were recorded. Right? So remember we were talking about the, that get processed 32 bits even. At the old, now at 64 bits. What is that dynamic range of a 64-bit sample? It's huge. <laughs> Massively huge. I mean, the amount of possible levels you can encode. It's essentially unclippable digitally. Okay, So that range is so huge, it's not clippable. It only clips when you then dumb it back down to 24 or 16 bit and stick that out of the <coughs> sound card. But internally here, you wouldn't hear that clipping because that 64 bit number is big enough to encode that. So I could bypass this thing and it won't sound like it's distorting. They're potentially, you know, it's 3 or 6 dB above the clip point. And we're not hearing the kind of clip distortion that you would expect, and that's because of the 64-bit processing. So all I'm really doing here is protecting myself from what happens when I convert it later. What? There's just like, unless you know, like you could accidentally bounce something and it distorts. Sure. And that's why these clip lights come on, is they're telling you, hey, look, you know, when you bounce this, it's going to be distorted. You can't hear that right now because we're doing a 64-bit. But if you see that clip light turn on, and you may not, you may not even bother you because like, well, nothing clipping. I don't hear anything clipping. And, that, and it's, it's, you know, all they're doing is predicting the clip. They're saying this would clip <laughs> if we were back in, you know, in the normal range. <laughs> Okay, and they're not very upfront about what that means in here, but that's what it means. Is is th that clip light will come on and you won't hear it, it clip, and that's why. It's because this this math they're doing this massive sixty four bit math that's why? quite happy to encode that massive number. Why is that secret? Why would they feel? It's not that they're. I mean, it's not that they're hiding that. It's just they're not very. They're, they don't explain that very clearly. Um, I have a question. Yes. This is really hypothetical. All right. So let's say. Fully expect that the end of the song, Christine is not going to hit that note because it's hard. Um, can you sidechain the click track so that when she stops singing, it automatically comes in? Sure. Of course. So what would that be? What would that be? Though? It'd be a gate. So I could put a gate on the click track, okay. and it would be a like a reverse gate essentially. So okay. I would say if if the live mic drops below the th this threshold, open up the recording. Yeah, but that'll kill you, though, because in this, in this particular song, if she's not singing, you're going to open it up. Yeah, but there's well, nothing there. If she's not singing, the recording doesn't have it in there either. But I thought there was other things in the recording. But I had it multi-track, oh. right? So I had eat the vocal isolated on a separate channel. So. You wouldn't have to do anything. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> You could, yeah, it's possible. That's dope. I love it. It's possible. I mean, I don't know that I would, uh, maybe I do, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, that's theoretically possible. Why don't you try it? It would take a little while to, to fine tune that threshold. 
That's right. True. That that'd be the Why tricky thing is you'd have to so you'd have to let people know what you were up to because you'd have to warn them that, hey, look, the only way for me to prototype this is to do it while she's doing it. Mm -hmm. So there might be some times where the recording kicks in, you know, when we're not expecting it. It's it's not a problem. I'm just fine tuning the gate. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually you'd get it and be fine. This turned out to be really useful in tech because when we were teching that massive sequence, she didn't want to sing that song. Um, and so we just turned on the, vo the voice in the recording and she just pretended to sing it for, you know, 20 hours of two 10 out of 12 days. <laughs> and, <you> know, <laughs> and we saved her voice. That's why she was able then to do the run. So it was great. Um, okay, I've got another little compression thing I'm doing here on my master output, okay? And this is my, my, my cool plugin I was telling you guys about that's worth the entire cost of the bundle, the L3LL. <laughs> that is the Jason Long This would be in the bundle, yes. Oh, wait, let me turn my reverb back on. Okay, so what this is doing, this is a multi-band limiter. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five frequency bands, and they are being limited independently. So I have an overall threshold. I've just set it to minus one right now, so it will just barely do a little bit. But what it's going to do is it's only going to limit the frequencies that start clipping. Leave the other stuff alone. You can fine tune this. You can fine tune these 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 gains per channel so that you can kind of tune it a little bit. But you can see it kicking in here. So this is frequency response across the synthesis. Okay, so did you hear when she did that, that big S and it killed that? Here we go, watch. Right? It caught that little S just a little bit without getting everything else. So let me see if I can let you hear what this is doing. This is without it. Now I'll turn it on. I might be a little more dramatic here. So there is without it. Okay. What's happening is I am I am able to get the whole thing to sound louder without it sounding compressed. Because I'm only compressing the frequencies that are getting out of control, and I'm leaving the ones that are fine alone. And so you don't get that sound of the compressor pulsing in and out, of the whole mix going up and down and up and down. It's only grabbing the things that are getting out of control and leaving the other things alone. So a lot of the mix is, be, is just being let, to let be. And only the stuff that gets out of hand uh, starts getting compressed on a frequency conscious basis. So there it is without it. See what it's doing. She paid some dues for that. She did. I hear it. I know it's, you know, we did this, uh, well, there's a funny story about that. So uh, we did this uh, early in the morning, this recording, um, which is a crappy time to ask a girl to sing this song. Um, so what she did, she came in and she sang the first half of the song before she warmed up, because the first half is in a really low register. And so she could hit the low notes easier. And then 
So we got halfway through saying these, you know, basically saying this part and this part first. And then here we sent her off to go warm up and I recorded Phantom. Um, and she came back and warmed up and we did the last half of the song. Um, and the, <laughs> when she got to that note, um, the guy that, that was running the, the Pro Tools rig for me, um, what, what, what happened? Oh, I, oh, I remember what happened. So the first time she tried to do it, she couldn't get her breath in time to hit the note, right? So she did the C, she was in, and then she's supposed to go up to the E, and there was not enough time between when she cut the C off and when she's supposed to, to get a big enough breath to get that note out. So she missed it. She didn't get it in in time. So it was like, all right, well, we got to do it again. So we went back and we said, well, and she said, oh, do I have to sing the whole thing again? I said, no, 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 we can just do that last part. And we just punch in that last note, okay? And so the guy that's running the Pro Tools rig, he says, we'll just punch it in. And the punch in is, is when you, you're, you're playing, you're listening, and then you just hit, you hit a button and it just starts recording right where you are, like that, okay? So we just kind of let her listen to that first, and when she got to that note, we just, he just said, well, I'll just hit the punch in button. And then she sang, was the, the, the idea was she would sing the note, we'd catch it, and we'd be done. Well, the punch in button malfunctioned. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's going in, and she's singing, singing, singing. She gets ready to the note, he hits the button, it doesn't fire, she sings the note, or she's off in the booth going, oh, and we don't hear anything, and, and we lost it. So this is why there's this thing called a pre-roll. Uh, the much safer way to do this, and, and Logic and Pro Tools to do this, is you can do an automatic punch in. So you can say, start the punch in at this point and let us hear five seconds before that. So you hit play, it'll play that first five seconds, then immediately instantly on its own, it'll open up the recording which is what the guy should have done, um, which is, but he didn't. So he, this is probably why his punch-in button was bad, because this is how he'd been doing all his punch-ins for however many years. Um, so the girl's voice teacher was there at the recording session, and she said, I only let her hit that note three times in a day. And then, and then I cut her off. She can't do it anymore, because she'll kill herself. She'll kill her voice. And uh, I said, okay, well, then this next time we got to get it <laughs> otherwise we have to come in tomorrow and uh so we we set up the pre-roll and everything and, did the, and you know, i talked to the guys like how about we just do the pre-roll he's like okay yeah we'll just do that and uh and so she so that was the third time she'd hit the note that morning um which is why it, it sounds a little strained <laughs> but we you know we weren't too worried about it because we she, her intention was to do it live every night and this would the, the recording was going to be the backup plan so we thought well We'll live with it. It's not that big of a deal. Yeah. I know. She said. She's like, I'm going to do it every night. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but she did it. Sure enough, she did it every night. How many times? Two weeks? No, this only ran for it. You know, she, she was, they did like, I don't think they ever had a two-show day. She only So she only have, had to do it once every day. Um, and it only ran like six to seven days, I think. So it was not, yeah, I mean, if she was going to do this for several months, forget it. Um, but she knew, it's like, I only got to do it like seven times. And, and only once a day. It's like, I can do it. It's like, okay. And she did. She pulled it off. Um, so anyway, so this, so this, uh, this multiband compressor or limiter is really, really handy. It's and it's it sound it sounds so transparent. I can I, you can get it you can get out of hand with it for sure. It'll let you do things that maybe you shouldn't do. You can get so aggressive with it that you just completely obliterate everything. But um, and you're and you you bounce the thing down and the wave file just looks like a big square wave because you. <laughs> but it doesn't sound clipped, you know. Uh, <laughs> it'll let you do that and you can get away with it. It also applies a dither as part of it. So uh, you can you can apply it 24 bit 20 you know whatever sort of dither you want on the output. I've got it 16 here because that's what the because the click track that we were given from really useful group was on a CD. It was 16 bit CD. So I just said, well, I'll put the vocal on that too, and so I dumped it down to 16 on a dither there. Um, you made that you made the instrument sound great too because I know those instruments and they don't sound that good. Yeah. So well, so I'll show one of them is an old Juno. Yeah, I'll show you what. I'll show you what we got here. So uh, some of this is MIDI, some of because I was trying to for the recording, I needed both the click track and what was going to be played live. So um, this is the click track.
So I just was given this. This is the same one that every fa production with Phantom uses. Okay. So what I added are, you know, all of the, you know, this, um, the brass, the strings, right? Strings, clarinet, flute. And I'm automating the mix too. And here we get to the really fun string stuff here. Flute in there. Are they all logic? Yeah. I mean, I worked with them quite a bit. I mean, I, I did the reverb. I was automating the mix of it quite a bit, and the organ. Uh, well, the organ is part of the click track, I think. I mean, I have it in here because this is timpani's. Let's see, organ. Um, yeah, okay, so, well, so it's in the click track, but I have it in MIDI here. There we go, there it is. Oh, go back. Oh, I'm, that's right, I've automated this. Because, so that last organ note is actually MIDI. <laughs> Because the click track cut off somehow, and I didn't quite understand. I don't. Yeah, the click track stopped, and and I wanted that that chord in there. So yeah, you watch this. Um, so that that chord is is real, <laughs> or is MIDI anyway. I think somewhere, how did I do it though? I want to say I must have, I put some automation on it somewhere. Must have been the mute that I automated. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, you know, that last, that last organ chord is not part of the, the click track. That, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> So you've got organ in the click track, and then you suddenly go here. So um, yeah, I could have you know I could have pulled that off with a side chain, right? I could have I could have put a gate on the organ and had it listen to the click track and say when the click track cuts out, I mute it, right? I could have done that, um, but. It was easier. I only had to do it for this one moment, so I just I'll just automate the mute. Um, okay, so that, that this is just some examples of different sorts of dynamics processing that I'm doing on different kinds of signals, um, you know, in a whole thing. Um, I'm trying to think, if there's any others in here that I'm doing? That's ten point one. Um, yeah, this is Logic ten one. I swear the compressor was different. I got 10.07. Maybe in 10.1 they changed it. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't been able to update. Um, so there you go. That's that's compression in a nutshell. Um, so play around with compressors. They're fun. Just use them for good, not evil. That's all the fun.